Alrighty guys, welcome back. Today we are going to be making a round knife or a head knife for leatherworking. I would like to note here that the majority of the inspiration for this build came from a legacy thread on blade forms and I will put a link to that thread in the description below. The thread was originated by TK Steingas while he was making his own set of head knives and there are golden contributions from Mr. Dave Ferry and Paul Long in that thread so it's worth your time to read through if you're going to be making a head knife yourself. Also note that if you're looking to purchase a head knife and not make one, Mr. Dave Ferry makes plenty of head knives and will oblige a custom order. While many of the pros use stainless steel for their head knives, I will be using a piece of 1075 so that I can heat treat it in my own home forge. I would normally use a piece of 1084, however, I was not able to find a piece of 1084 thin enough for this project. So I ordered this piece of 1075, which is about 58 thousandths of an inch thick. We're going to be bringing this down substantially in the build because according to Mr. Paul Long, who uses many head knives, he said that the ideal thickness is somewhere around the 41 to 46 thousandths mark. On the design of this head knife, we're going with a single point design instead of a dual sided design. Reason being is that we're using a piece of three inch wide stock from Alpha Knife Supply and I just don't have enough room to put two points on this piece of steel. This two inch contact wheel fitting into the curves of this knife was actually a happy surprise because I did not plan for this when drawing this knife up in CAD. If you would like access to the PDF template for this head knife along with the other knives that I build on this channel, head on over to the Redbeard Ops Patreon. As you just saw on your screen, I was putting some checkering into the spine of this head knife. There is no point for putting checkering onto a spine of a head knife and I would advise against it for that reason. I'm going to be drilling five holes into the tang of this knife, an eighth of an inch center hole, two eighth of an inch holes kind of for the epoxy to move in between the scales, and then two number 13 holes for which I thought were going to be corpy fasteners, but ended up being loveless bolts. A number 13 hole is really not the ideal size for a loveless fastener. If you're going to be using loveless, I would advise drilling a number 28 hole, which is around the 140 thousandths. We then quenched this blade in Parks 50, and I put it in my straightening jig here to hold it straight after the quench as it cools, so that I didn't get any warps. While the jig is not quite wide enough for this knife, it actually did a good job at holding everything relatively straight. The head knife easily skated a file, so we will be moving on to tempering. I clamped the blade between two pieces of angle iron just to further reduce the risk of catching any warps during the tempering process. We tempered at around 198 degrees Celsius, which is approximately 388 degrees Fahrenheit. The goal here was to achieve a rock wall hardness around a 60 one to a 62 Rockwell hardness. And this is why I am tempering at a slightly lower temperature than what I normally do with my knives. Once we're finished with the heat treating process, we'll be using my surface grinding attachment to bring this knife down to its target dimension in thickness and also cleaning up the flats. I'll be using a three inch wide 120 grit belt from Combat Abrasives. The wheel on my surface grinding attachment is around three inches wide and the magnetic chuck is two and a half inches wide. That means that I will have a little bit of overhang with the knife not contacting the magnetic chuck all the way from the width perspective. And in order to combat any type of flex that I'll get, I'm going to be making very small movements towards the wheel with my feed. Since this blade has already been heat treated, I made sure to check it frequently with my bare hands just to ensure that it was not getting too hot during the surface grinding process. By using a fresh 120 grit ceramic belt along with a very soft feed towards the wheel, heat was not an issue when surface grinding this knife. As you can see there, it takes a little bit of finagling on the magnetic chuck to make sure that I get the knife as lined up with the three inch contact wheel as I could. After all was said and done with the surface grinding attachment, we got the total thickness of this knife to around 42 thousandths of an inch, which is around the target that Mr. Paul Long called out in the original thread. I then marked the edge with a very thin drill bit so that I have a target to grind to. Grinding a head knife proved to be extremely difficult. Mr. Dave Ferry in the original thread 
noted on how difficult grinding these knives can be and how they can actually be fairly dangerous to grind, especially if you have two points, because one of those points could grab the belt and throw the knife. He said that a lot of the grinding that he does on these knives, he's actually standing off to the side of the grinder. In my case, I tried a couple different techniques, and you can see me alternating through them here until I find one that I like. The magnet method was actually working fairly well until the magnet started attracting itself to the steel platen itself, and I didn't like that. So I went with this holding method at the end of my grinding and it actually worked the best. Mr. Dave recommended grinding these types of head knives with a flat grind from the front of the handle scales down to a zero edge. I was able to achieve close to this. I think my edge at the end of my grinding was around a four to six thousandths of an inch edge. I must say that the grinding process of a head knife was not terribly enjoyable to me. Maybe it's because I wasn't very good at it and I need more practice with this style of knife. However, I was ready to get off the grinder as fast as I could. Once I did get off the grinder, I brought the knife up to around a 600 grit hand sanded finish. A dirty 600 grit finish, meaning that all the scratches weren't necessarily going in the same direction, but I had around a 600 grit finish on this knife, which was good enough for me, since this is gonna just be a tool for my shop. It was advised to get these knives up to a fairly high grit finish, probably even higher than a 600 grit finish to aid in its cutting ability through leather. I decided to go ahead and put my maker's mark on this knife just because I think it will look cool when I pull it out to work on my leather working projects. As far as the handle scales go, we will not be using any exotic materials for this knife. We will be using some canvas micarta. However, for the fasteners, we will be custom making the loveless fasteners on my new Atlas Craftsman lathe, so stay tuned for that later on in the video. We get the micarta cut out and flattened, and then we will clamp the blade up to drill the holes through the knife and into the micarta. Once again, I'm using number 13 holes that would be just fine for Corby fasteners and that are slightly too large for loveless fasteners. What this basically means is later in the build, I will have to do a little more finagling during the glue up to make sure everything is locked down nice and straight. If I drilled smaller holes, that alignment would already have been accomplished for me with the OD of the loveless fasteners being nice and tight into the tang of the knife. Here I am putting a grinding target for the front of my handle scales. We will be grinding the front of the handle scales down to a 45 degree angle so that they look aesthetically pleasing and they're not just a square cutoff. Using a fresh ceramic belt is a must whenever you're grinding micarta so that you do not burn it. It is an easily burnable handle material and when you burn it, it just looks terrible. I bring up the front of the handle scales to a 600 grit finish and then I am playing around with the little buffer in my drill press to see how that looks uh, because I've never used it before on my carta. Lastly, on the handle prep, before starting the loveless fasteners, we will be drilling our counter boards into the micarta handle scales. I set up a stop on my mill so that I get the same depth on all four of these holes. I'm going into each of these quarter inch handle scales by around two and a half sixteenths of an inch. So here I'm gonna show a couple clips of how I made these loveless fasteners. I'm gonna have an entire video dedicated to the loveless fastener coming up in the near future, so stay tuned for that. But here is a little preview. So in a nutshell, I took a piece of 316 stainless, chucked it up inside of my collet block, which I then chucked up inside of the lathe's four jaw chuck. I drilled a number 36 hole through the center of the stock and then tapped it to 632. Once I had it tapped, I measured off a quarter inch piece and then parted it on the lathe. Then you just repeat the process until you have enough pieces for your loveless fasteners. The glue up on this round knife is pretty basic. The first step, just like any other glue up, is to clean all of your components with rubbing alcohol. Then I mixed up two equal parts of the Rogue Combat Abrasives Epoxy. Uh, I used the Rogue in this case because I wanted to have a fairly quick cure time in comparison to the G-Plex, and I knew that this knife would not be taking any major impact hits where I think the G-Flex really shines. You can see that I applied just a little bit of epoxy to the heads of the loveless fasteners before inserting them into their counterbores, 
and then very carefully I used the impact driver to bring the entire assembly together. Once I got it close, I finished tightening those loveless fasteners with a hand screwdriver, not the impact driver. You don't want to get the loveless fasteners too tight, just like with a Corby fastener, because then you can squeeze some of the epoxy out of your joint and have a bad joint. It's been cold out in my shop, so I lit this knife cure in the house for around 16 hours overnight and then we got back to grinding the next day. I ground the handle scales flat on both sides and then we put a slight taper from the back of the knife to the front of the knife on the handle scales with the flat platen. And then used a two inch contact wheel to get the scales down to the metal on the tang. On the flat platen, I then carefully did some rounding on the handle scales along the length of the knife. Lastly, on the grinder, we'll be using the scalloped J-Flex belts here. These are a 220 grit scalloped one inch J-Flex belt and that just helps round over some of those edges and gets a little bit of contouring out of the way before moving on to hand sanding. Normally I would clamp the blade while I was hand sanding the handle but in this case since the blade is such a thin material I didn't want to risk uh, damaging the knife at all so I just hand sanded it by holding it. I brought it up to a 600 grit finish and then lightly buffed. I tried a couple of different sharpening methods for this knife. Uh, Mr. Dave Ferry recommends using the 2x72 belt grinder, so I tried that out. I also tried a hand method, which would work fine uh, with some patience. And then towards the end of the video, I landed on my favorite method, which uh, I'll show in the modification section of this video, but it's basically my wind water-cooled sharpening system. Even with the hand method here, I use my power strop on the water-cooled sharpening system from Win. Uh, just as my strop. I then did a few test cuts and decided to make a little slip for this knife so I don't cut myself when putting it into my leather working toolbox. The knife did a pretty good job at this point with the test cuts. Towards the end of the video, like I mentioned earlier, we'll have a modification section that will really get this thing tuned in. Mr. Dave Ferry told me recently that a gentleman on the forums named Chris Jones is the one who designed this type of slip sheath for a head knife. So we will be using his design, Chris Jones, and making ourselves a nice leather slip. I am making the welt on this knife around 3 8 of an inch. And then you can see me here drawing out how the knife will enter the sheath so that I can make sure to have the opening of the sheath large enough for this head knife to enter. I then modify my sheath based on the path of the knife coming into it, cut it out, and then we'll get it cut out on some leather. Like a knife sheath for a large buoy or something with a guard, this knife sheath will contain three pieces. The front piece, which will be glued onto the welt, which will be glued onto the back piece. The back piece, in my case, will have a strap that comes over the side of the head knife to hold it into the slip. I'll be using a snap for this. However, you can also use a stud or any other type of attachment mechanism for your strap. I am new to leather tooling, so here I'm just playing around, uh, nothing too fancy on this design, uh, just throwing in some stamps to kind of make it look a little cooler. I then mark out where I want my holes to be with a pricking iron so that later when I press those holes in with my drill press, uh, I'll have a good target. Before gluing the sheath together, we have to put in the receiving end for this snap. To glue it together, we'll be using barge contact cement, which is the gold standard in leather working. We get the barge along where our welt will land in the back piece. We put it on the welt itself and then on the front piece. You can see I have a little piece of thin pig skin there which I actually got off of an old pair of gloves. While I would never do this in anything that I'm selling, I figured I would throw in this older piece of leather that's a little worn into the inside of this sheath so that it will protect the knife from being scratched by the snap. We'll then install the male side of the snap to the strap and move over to the drill press with a needle in it to puncture the sheath through all three layers for our holes. I am using a fairly thick gauge needle here in my drill press. It is spinning. While you don't need the spin, I found that the spin just makes it a little easier to pass through the leather. I'm not removing any material like you would with a drill bit. It's more of like a power awl, I would say. I'm still trying to find just the right size needle for my power awl 
drill press operation there. The needle that I just used is a tad too small and it's pretty hard to get the second needle through on my saddle stitch. And then if I use something like a finishing nail, the hole's too big in my opinion. So I'm still trying to find just the right size needle there. A little side tip for y'all who are getting in into leather working, I normally cut off around nine times the length that I'll be stitching with the saddle stitch in my thread. So far this hasn't failed me yet. Once I get to the end here, I'll do one back stitch and then uh, cut them off in the back of the sheath. We're gonna focus a little bit on the edge here. I put a little bit of quick slick on the edge and then use a 220 grit belt on my belt sander. The belt on that belt sander is only used for leather work and I keep it on the side so that it doesn't get contaminated with metal shavings or anything else. I then put some quick slick along the edge and use a 320 grit piece of sandpaper until the edge gets smooth. Then I step it up to a 600 grit piece of sandpaper, then beeswax, and then the hand burnishing tool. As I mentioned earlier, the last part of this video is going to be some modifications and tweaks to the head knife in order to increase its performance and increase its performance in my hand specifically. The first modification is going to be on the overall length of the knife. This knife is slightly too long for me and I have a hard time guiding it with my two fingers on my right hand, my peace sign fingers. So I'll be taking off around a half of an inch on the back of this handle so that it sits into my palm a little more comfortably. To do this, I just hit it with a ceramic belt on the wheel here, the eight inch contact wheel, until I got down to my little line there that I drew on the side of the handle with a piece of pencil. The next tweak is gonna be on the sharpening. I got it set up on my water-cooled sharpener from Wynn with the rest and I was just a little bit more comfortable here and I got the knife sharper than it was before. I don't think this is necessarily the right or the wrong way, it's just a sharpening system that I find myself to be comfortable with. After I got it sharp on the wheel, I knocked the burr off with a power strop and the knife came out significantly sharper than what I was able to achieve before. I'll also note that I didn't show it here, but I did round over the tip on the knife a little bit. And what that did was it stopped the knife from easily cutting into the cutting board and getting stuck. While with a soft cutting board like I'm using here, it will still get stuck from time to time. By rounding over the tip of the knife, it doesn't get stuck nearly as easily into the cutting board. Once again, Mr. Dave Ferry comes to the rescue with a recommendation for a cutting board for leather working. This cutting board is hard enough for the knife to skate across the surface without digging in so that you'll only cut the leather and not dig into the cutting board. I have not purchased one of these yet, but I plan on ordering one in the future, and I'll put a link and a picture up on your screen here. Even with my softer cutting board, the improved sharpness, the rounding of the tip, and the modification on the length of this knife made a huge difference in its performance. Since this is really the first full-size head knife that I've made, I plan on using this in my future leatherworking projects, at least for the next couple of months, so that I can see what I do and don't like about the design. After which, I'll probably make some modifications and then maybe make another one. I would be remiss if I did not point out some flaws in the aesthetics of this knife. Towards my secondary bevel, you can see some hard scratches here in my finish. This happened while I was using different sharpening methods for this edge, and I apologize for my lack of attention to detail. Once again, I'd like to give a major shout out to everyone who contributed to the original thread on blade forms on head knife design. More specifically to TK Steingas, Mr. Dave Ferry at Horseright Clothing, and then Mr. Paul Long, as well as Chris Jones for the sheath design. Like always, if y'all like this video, go ahead and hit that like button down below and consider subscribing to the channel. If you have some comments on this build or some improvements that could be made to the design, please drop them in the comment section below. I'll be putting the PDF plans for this knife on Patreon if you're interested in printing them out. Until the next time, I'll catch y'all on the flip side.